Welcome everyone. I think we're going to get started. Um, my name is Kelsey Lamp and I am the Protect Our Oceans Campaign Director with Environment America. Thank you all for joining us for the third webinar in our Meet Our Ocean webinar series. This month we're taking some time to learn about the places in our ocean that play home to the ocean life that we all love, our sea turtles, our fish, and more. I'm excited to have you all here today to learn more about our coral reefs. I think for a lot of people, when you picture a healthy ocean, you think of those iconic images of coral reefs from nature documentaries of the Great Barrier Reef or the coral off Hawaii's coast. I know that as a kid growing up in landlocked Nevada, those were some of my first images of the ocean and those images of coral reef, the Florida Keys and Hawaii, Excite, keep me excited to run campaigns to stop offshore drilling, reduce plastic pollution, and more sustainably manage our ocean. But even though they are some of our more recognizable ocean habitats, there is still a lot to learn about coral reefs and their role in our ocean. Coral reefs aren't all the same, and some reefs aren't even made of coral. So today we'll hear from scientists about two reefs that can be found right off the continental US what ocean life calls them home, and more about how we can address the threats facing our reefs. With that, I'll introduce our speakers. So today I'm joined by Dr. Peter Oster and Caitlin Lustick. First, we'll hear from Peter about Georgia's hidden gem, Gray's Reef, and then we'll turn to Caitlin to talk about her work in the Florida Reef. Then we'll have some time at the end for questions um, for you to ask our panelists. And so if you have questions throughout the webinar, please throw them in the Q&A box and we'll make sure to get to them at the end. So now I'm excited to introduce Dr. Peter Oster, Senior Research Scientist at Mystic Aquarium in Mystic, Connecticut, and Research Professor Emeritus of Marine Sciences at the University of Connecticut. He is a marine ecologist and for over 40 years has addressed questions about the relationships between habitat, fish communities, and local biodiversity the effects of human disturbance to marine communities and the role that marine protected areas can play as a tool for conservation and sustainable use of marine biodiversity. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Peter. Thanks, thanks Kelsey, and thanks everyone for, for taking time to join us tonight. Uh, I guess I'm gonna share my screen. And hopefully everybody can see that. Yep. All right, That's excellent. Enough. So uh, as, as Kelsey noted, I'm a, a marine ecologist and working on issues around both the fundamental ecology of fishes and uh, the effects of human use <clears throat> on the ocean and the role that marine protected areas can play as a tool for conservation and sustainable use of biological diversity. Here, this is, this is me underwater. Most I explain to my family that I hang out underwater and look at fish because it's easier than trying to talk about uh, the science of ecology. And that's my colleague, uh, Randy Rudd, who works with me uh, frequently at, uh, at Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary. And we're the two old men uh, on many of these expeditions, much like uh, uh, Waldorf and Statler from the Muppets. Uh, so all due consideration to them. Uh, as Kelsey noted, there are different kinds of reefs. And so what I want to uh, start out with is, you know, what is a reef? Because Gray's Reef, uh, and the Grays Reef, and those in that Grays Reef National Marine Sanctuary are not uh, uh, reefs formed by the growth of hard corals. Uh, but reefs, by definition, are hard bottom marine habitats rising above the surrounding seafloor. Uh, uh, they can either be geologic in nature, bedrock or, or, or stony like cobbles or boulders, or derived from organisms like corals, uh, but also organisms like calcareous worms and oysters and mussels and other kinds of things. This is a place called Ellis Reef right here in Long Island Sound off Connecticut uh, that was recently designated as a new estuarine, uh, the area that, it can, that surrounds it as a uh, new National Estuarine Research Reserve. This is Gray's Reef, uh, and this is a coral reef in the Caribbean. The, but reefs in general are a foundation for communities of attached and mobile organisms. They're characterized by biodiverse communities or ecosystems, depending on, on, on where you want to draw boundaries, and are in general are spatially rare. And the thing that's of interest to me 
is that research places with enhanced species interactions. The things that I study are how, principally how, how mobile organisms, mostly fishes, uh, in mixed species groups interact to be able to find prey and avoid predators. And most recently working on higher trophic level on apex predators and how they cooperate to hunt for prey. Uh, and then the responses of prey to that hunting pressure. And so just a really quick story about my first dives at Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, this is a sandbar shark. Uh, they can get be kind of curious and a little bit aggressive <clears throat> underwater. And so one of my first dives there, I had just finished four years of working at coral reefs uh, in the equatorial regions of the globe, uh, studying these kinds of, of, of group foraging, group hunting kinds of behaviors and reef fishes. And was describing this to a friend and colleague of mine who at the time was the science research uh, coordinator there. And he said, geez, all that stuff's going on right here at Gray's Reef. And that was after I you know, went to the other side of the world to look at those kinds of things in the Northern Great Barrier Reef. And so Greg invited my, me down and I went down with a, with a couple of students and I had this brand new grad student. We jump in the water and we're on this very narrow uh, reef <clears throat> in the sanctuary. And as soon as we got to the bottom, we're surrounded by the school, big school of Blue Runner. And they're circling us and you can't see, you know, five feet out from our masks. And all of a sudden the circle starts getting tighter and tighter and the fish are moving faster and faster. And I'm thinking to myself, this can't be a good thing, although this is really cool. And so we, you know, I tap my grad student on the shoulder and we move down the reef and the ball and the ball of fish follows us. And we move down the reef a little more and the ball of fish follows us. And all of a sudden all the fish split and the sandbar shark comes bursting through chased in fish. And in my brain, the lower brain stems going shark. And the upper and my upper brain functions are going, wow, this is really cool. Take a picture. And I'm, I'm having this in, internal conversation, probably in the course of only several seconds, but it seems like minutes. And, you know, this all happened. And, and we kind of said, geez, you know, we're, are the sharks around? Maybe we ought to go, you know, go back up to the boat and find another and, and dive somewhere else. And I got back and I was telling telling my friend this. And it's like I said, geez, I didn't take the picture. I got back to the to, to the computer and I did take the picture and I bopped the shark on the head with a camera. So it kind of screamed away. So that was my, it's like, this is the place I want to keep coming back to work because this is where all this stuff is happening, literally in my backyard, just down the coast from Connecticut. Uh, and so I've been doing that since, nine, since 2008. Uh, and Gray's Reef is just this little, really this hidden gem uh, in the, in, in our, off the Southeast U S the, uh, this is what the, the, re the reefs look like. These are sandstone, uh, outcrops <clears throat> that are exposed above a, a surrounding sand plain and just covered with dense invertebrates. Uh, these big barrel sponges, uh, diversity of other, other sponge species. These are octocorals. Uh, there's also a hard coral oculina, uh, that grows on the reefs. Although, I just gotten back from travel. I couldn't find a slide of Oculina. But in any case, there's there's these uh, uh, just dense invertebrates covering the sandstone outcrops. Gray's Reef sits in a subtropical region. <clears throat> it was designated, designated in 1981 and discovered 20 years prior to that by a curator at the uh, at University of Georgia's Marine Institute. Uh, and he was a collector, uh, Milton Sam Gray. It's a 22 square mile area. Uh, off of Sapelo Island, northern Georgia, uh, and rests in 55 to 65 feet of water. These sandstone outcroppings or reefs uh, can be up to three meters in height, <clears throat> uh, and some are undercut, some are simply exposed uh, rocky surface, and other live bottom reefs are draped in sand, so you really don't even see the rocky parts. Uh, but these form one of the densest areas of sandstone reefs off the southeast United States. And since 2011, uh, one third has been set aside as a research area. Again, another picture of a reef, these large barrel sponges <clears throat> characterize the, uh, the site. Uh, the sponges themselves provide cover and all the invertebrates provide cover for a wide diversity of animals. This is a black sea bass uh, resting on top of a barrel sponge waiting for prey to swim by. Uh, and when disturbed, will duck down into the, into the uh, uh, opening of the sponge for cover. What's going on? There we go. And these areas, that, well, my interest is fishes. Uh, there's a tremendous diversity of invertebrates uh, here too. This is a, a regal, oh, geez, now I've already, 
this is COVID fog. I came back from a trip and, and my wife and I are uh, recovering from, uh, from, from COVID. So I'm at least attributing this to my uh, recollection issues to that as opposed to just being old. Uh, but this is a beautiful nudibranch uh, that feeds on sponges. Uh, there are uh, <clears throat> other mobile invertebrates that live in the reef uh, as well, like this octopus. Uh, these are these are uh, uh, soapfish, uh, so small school soapfish with their with their very cute eyes peering out from under an, one, an undercut ledge uh, in the reef. Uh, oyster toadfish uh, surrounded by acorn worms and juvenile kubu, which are drums. Uh, they grow up to be much blander looking, uh, but when they're juveniles. Uh, they have this, they have this, these, this these beautiful long uh, dorsal uh, dorsal spines and black and white stripes. Uh, and under the ledges too are fish that come out at night, uh, like two spot cardinal fish. These red fish, uh, the red color reduces their visibility to other other predators uh, around dusk when they often emerge <clears throat> to feed on zooplankton over the reef. Uh, this is a cleaner shrimp, uh, Paraclimenes. Uh, there are uh, eels that live within the, the crevices and undercuts of the reef, like these reticulated mores. And I think this is a, a, a smaller uh, a green more, but again, because I'm, I'm can't, can't go to the office because of COVID, my ID books are, uh, are not handy and I've been working elsewhere uh, recently. So this is just not coming to mind, but this is a very pretty more in one of the uh, undercut uh, areas of the, of the ledge. Uh, large nurse sharks, as, as large and, and longer than I am, uh, occupy the, the, the undercut parts of the ledges to rest, as do sea turtles. Uh, loggerheads and green, and green sea turtles use the uh, Gray's Reef as a resting area. And so this is an example of uh, a live bottom habitat that doesn't have the exposed sandstone ledge uh, as char characteristic of a reef, but this is a slight rise from the surrounding seafloor. And these are, uh, these are soft corals as well. And again, black sea bass. Uh, and Atlantic guitarfish <clears throat> and several species of sponges. And again, these are, the, these are soft corals. These provide habitat for forage fish fish that serve as prey for other uh, aerotrophic level predators. And these are tomtates. Uh, and again, another example of, uh, of, of, of live bottom habitat. And then this, there's, it's not just the invertebrates and fish that rest on the seafloor <clears throat> that, uh, that use these, these ledges. These are Atlantic spade fish and they're associated with ledges up above and up into the water column. Uh, in large and dense schools and other predators, these are zooplanktivores, uh, primarily feeding on gelatinous zooplankton like, like uh, uh, jellies. Uh, but these schools are used for, as cover, <clears throat> boy, excuse me, as cover for other predators to hide and then strike out at smaller forage fish that occur in schools uh, over and around the ledges. So <clears throat> one of the real characteristics of these areas is these dense uh, schools of, of, you call them bait fish or forage fish. And these can be multiple species. The clo ones closest to the ledge are juvenile tomtates. And the ones over those, uh, over, the, over the tomtates are, locally they're known as cigar minnows. Uh, the genus is the capturus. They're related to mackerels and they're both round and mackerel scad. Uh, that are part of these schools. And they occur during the day <clears throat> in, 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 in dense aggregations uh, that attract predators uh, to hunt around these ledges. Uh, the, they, the forage fish, the bait fish are attracted both to the ledge and range up into the water column and to the surface. You'll see bait, if you're riding in a boat over the reef, you'll see bait balls. Uh, uh, working the area and being in the middle of all this when the fish are being attacked uh, is just is a, a, a really interesting experience as well as uh, uh, ecologically interesting to look at the interactions of species like Spanish mackerel uh, that hunt from the top of the schools and from the sides 
Uh, these are red snapper. Uh, the Spanish mackerel are often above them. Here you can see Spanish mackerel here, red snapper attacking schools of the, the bait fish here. These are the cigar minnows, the, uh, the scad. Uh, and then these are black sea bass that are in high densities uh, attacking fish from underneath the school that's being pushed down by their predators above. And so all these interactions are taking place and facilitated by the predators balling up the, the prey fish uh, so multiple species can take advantage of the attacks. Uh, also underneath <clears throat> the schools are species like scamp and gag grouper. Uh, these are uh, large broomtail uh, scamp that use the ledge, the undercut parts of the ledge for shelter and emerge to attack fish and, 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 and uh, crustaceans for prey. Uh, there's uh, yellow jacks that hunt in groups, greater amberjack, barracuda hunting either as large individuals. This guy was about five feet long uh, and a little annoyed that we were there collecting data. Uh, and they'll also uh, hunt in, in schools. Nurse, nursery sharks, nurse, nursery sharks, nurse shark uh, also hunt crustaceans and small fish uh, around the ledges. And then even marine mammals like dolphins, this is a common dolphin, uh, hunt around the ledges. And when there are dolphins around and we can hear the clicks underwater uh, when they're in the area, there's virtually no other predation going on because uh, all the predators are hiding because having a big big scamp grouper for lunch, I think would be a, 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 tasty, uh, a tasty meal for a, a, for a uh, for a pot of dolphins. And so we see all these interactions occurring at the, at the, on the reef, in the water column, from the surface when we're including marine mammals. And so this is a, <clears throat> an incredible place because again, uh, a third of it's protected as a research area, so there's no fishing. Uh, but even the amount of fishing that occurs outside the, uh, the, the closed area is at this stage relatively low and uh, and so we can use the research area as a way to gauge the effects of sustainable use outside in the National Marine Sanctuary and the surrounding region. So, I mean, the questions often ask why protect these places? Uh, these, and, and so, I mean, there's a number of answers. One is these are examples of species and processes that are ecologically sensitive and vulnerable to disturbance. We know from other areas that dragging, dragging uh, gear and anchors <clears throat> over the ledge can dislodge and kill the animals that make the that make these biodiversity hotspots. And by overfishing, we can re, uh, uh, eliminate the kinds of interactions that enhances uh, prey availability to the wide range of predators. Having this, these, this area protected allows us to study ocean processes in the absence of local human impacts, essentially asking questions like, how does the ocean work without us? And this is valuable because that way we can use this to compare changes uh, to communities, fishes, and vertebrates uh, in other areas, <clears throat> local based on being able to, to, to tease out local impacts from regional effects and the effects of global change. Because just knowing that things change uh, isn't enough to be able to, to intervene in a management perspective to, uh, to reduce those impacts and to restore uh, ocean ecosystems. Certainly there's some practical, this, these, aren't, these aren't just playgrounds for scientists. There's practical uh, uh, and, and ethical issues as well uh, that, 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 that these satisfy. We wanna be able to export through spillover uh, to surrounding areas, eggs, larvae, juveniles, adults, and conserve the genetic diversity <clears throat> that's inherent to, to populations that are not being impacted uh, by humans. So we can repopulate, help restore areas that are affected uh, outside the sanctuary. Uh, sanctuary and the research area can be part of the solution, examples of a solution uh, to the climate and biodiversity crisis crises, where we look to the ocean for solutions, not just to continue to identify problems. And perhaps uh, more importantly, <clears throat> or existentially, this is one of multiple places across our nation that represent our natural heritage. And having places that we protect uh, from human uses while others we use for sustainable uh, exploitation of diversity uh, is, a, uh, is, is, is patriotic. It's one of the fundamental uh, things that we do as a nation. Uh, 
and it's represented by places like Yellowstone National Park and Grand Canyon and the multitude of other places across the country and now into the ocean uh, that, we, that, that we use to represent our, uh, our natural heritage. A parting thought <clears throat> from Aldo Leopold, uh, a conservationist uh, from uh, the early part of the 1900s, is that the oldest task in human history is to live on a piece of land without spoiling it. And a lot, and having protected areas in national marine sanctuaries and other places allow us allows us to assess what role humans are playing in uh, a changing ocean. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, that's uh, that's the end, or at least this really is the end. Thanks so much, Peter. Oh my gosh, I am so excited about that shark story. I've never heard that one before, but very exciting exciting times. Now we're going to turn it over to Caitlin Lustick um, of the Nature Conservancy. Caitlin is um, the South Florida Marine Conservation Manager for the Nature Conservancy and she's based in the Florida Keys. In her 12 years with TNC, her work has centered around the conservation and restoration of coral reefs and associated habitats along Florida's coral reef. Caitlin leads the Florida Reef Resilience Program and serves on the Southeast Florida Coral Reef Initiative Technical Advisory Committee. So I will turn it over to Caitlin to tell us more about Florida Keys and the Florida Reef. Can you see my slides? Yes, looks great. great. Thanks, Kelsey. So I'll just start with a little background about how I got here, because I also grew up in landlocked Ohio. <laughs> um, and I, when I was in the second grade, I decided I was going to be a marine biologist, because I had a um, student teacher from Australia who taught us about the Great Barrier Reef. And I came home and told my mom that's what I was going to do. And I'm pretty sure she thought that's not ever what you're going to do, but sure. <laughs> Um, and I went to college in Ohio, so I wasn't even moving in the right direction, but I took scuba. I spent a semester studying in Turks and Caicos, um, and we spent our days snorkeling, diving, identifying fish and corals, and learning about how the health of the marine ecosystem um, influences local economies. And that was it for me. So here I am, <laughs> living in the Keys, uh, doing coral restoration for the Nature Conservancy. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the Florida's coral reef in general, and then kind of zoom into the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. So Florida is the only place in the continent, continental United States with extensive shallow water coral reefs. Um, and this is stony coral based coral reefs. So Peter's uh, intro was a good sort of background on this. So the reason that this is true is because stony corals are very picky about where they'll live. So they need hard substrate to um, settle on. They need uh, a really narrow range of temperatures. It's not too hot or too cold. Um, and they need clear water with relatively low nutrient input. Um, so in, you know, Florida's kind of right on the edge of where we get that, that warm water coming out of the Caribbean Sea um, and further north. Um, we just don't have the temperatures for corals to be able to survive. So Florida's coral reef runs 360 miles um, from Dry Tortugas National Park, which is about 70 miles west of Key West, up through the St. Lucie Inlet in Martin County. And many different decision makers are working to protect the, air, the reef in different areas. But the ecosystem is all interconnected, and so efforts are always being to um, work across these boundaries. Over half of Florida's coral reef falls within the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. It was established in 1990, and it's jointly managed by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, and the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. It protects 3,800 square miles of unique marine resources which includes sea, seagrass beds, mangroves, coral reefs, and over 6,000 species of marine life. The sanctuary has implemented uh, various strategies to help protect the health of the ecosystems. And some of those include things like establishing zones where certain activities are limited and installing and maintaining mooring buoys. And so you can see here a set of mooring buoys 
um, at Lou Key, which is a sanctuary preservation area in the lower Florida Keys off of Big Pine Key, which is where I'm based. The sanctuary shares uh, borders with three national parks and four national wildlife refuges. And a sanctuary management plan dictates what activities can take place where, and that plan is currently being reviewed. Coral reefs are incredibly diverse. Um, they're often referred to as the rainforests of the sea. And looking at the pictures that Peter was showing, they look very similar in many ways, except the main difference is that we have um, the stony corals. So the hard structure of the reef is created by these stony corals. And as you can see, they come in lots of different shapes, sizes, colors. Um, they're a colonial organism. And it, so they're made up of hundred, hundreds or thousands of individual animals known as polyps. And as they grow, they create a calcium carbonate skeleton, and that builds the 3D structure that we call the reef. And the reef is also inhabited by soft corals, algae, sponges, and other invertebrates. So a lot of this looks similar to what Peter was showing. Um, and when the system's in balance, all of these different organisms are living in harmony with one another, and they each take up um, an appropriate amount of space and the right space. However, when the stony coral population declines, as is currently happening in Florida, some of these species end up being more abundant than they should be. And the reef habitat also supports uh, lots of charismatic and mobile species. Um, again, you saw a lot of these in Peter's um, talk. And they provide shelter, food, and spawning and nursery habitat for fish, rays, uh, turtles, sharks, lobsters, all the things that we love to see when we go diving. They also are really important to people. So they serve as the backbone of both the economy and way of life in the Florida Keys. Um, they're our first line of defense against storms and flooding uh, because they break waves before they reach our shoreline and our homes and infrastructure. They provide habitat for commercially important fish and invertebrates, which in turn support our fishing related industries. And they provide recreational opportunities for residents and visitors, uh, which helps to support our tourism-based economy. So the sanctuary supports about 43,000 jobs in the Keys and contributes an estimated $4.4 billion annually to the state's economy. But our reefs are also facing a variety of threats, both local and global. The combined effects of climate change, poor water quality, and overuse of the resources has caused a significant decline in the health of the stony corals that make up our reefs. And some of these issues are small and local um, by comparison, and so they can be addressed pretty effectively by local reef managers, but others are regional or global in scale, and so they require more dramatic and coordinated action. So for example, water quality issues, um, can encompass a range of, of different problems, but that mostly references um, increased nutrients and bacteria from things like fertilizer runoff, partially treated wastewater, which is the picture that you see there, um, and stormwater. And those, the increased nutrients can cause algae to outcompete corals. And it can also cause corals to be more susceptible to disease outbreaks. The most recent threat that we're facing in it, on the Florida reef tract is the stony coral tissue loss disease, um, which you can see that big coral head, that, that is what that has. It's caused a decline in over half the coral species found here in Florida. And generally speaking, when we have disease outbreaks, they affect one or two species at a time. This one's affecting 22 to 23 species. Um, so just by comparison, it also, um, kills the coral quite quickly if it's not treated. Um, so this is resulting in significant changes to the coral community. And natural recovery of coral is already a very slow process. Um, and there's not much evidence that corals are rebounding on their own in Florida. In the 1980s, about 25% of the, of the reef habitat was covered in healthy coral. And in 2019, that percentage had decreased to 5% and is now as low as 2% on, on some reefs in, in Florida. And so as a result, based on an assessment conducted by NOAA's coral reef monitoring program, Florida's coral reef is classified as impaired. Um, and this assessment looks at various ecological data sets that the program collects every two years here in Florida. And it provides a baseline for which future assessments can be compared. And hopefully 
they'll get better. <laughs> that's our hope. <laughs> so that's a lot of doom and gloom. Um, our coral reefs are threatened by a variety of stressors, but with strong protections and active restoration, we can still give coral a fighting chance here in Florida. Um, and there's good reason to, because the people and the animals that depend on the reefs are still here. Um, these are the, what I show here are two examples of reasons we can be hopeful as the management and scientific community continue to come together to try to further protect and restore our reefs. The Florida Reef Resilience Program recent really, recently released a resilience action plan that identifies steps that reef managers, policymakers, and reef users can take to address the threats to Florida's reef and rapidly increase coral restoration efforts. And coral restoration has been going on in Florida since 2004 and has increased both in scale and in species diversity. Um, but the effort is not keeping pace currently with the decline. Um, so various groups are developing these coral restoration plans that seek to increase the scale and efficiency of restoration. And so this is an example um, of one of those plans. And while the immediate benefits of restoration are, enc are encouraging, the long-term benefits are even more important. So the goal of coral reef restoration is to, we call it outplant. So when we put these corals on the reef, um, we do so in a way that encourages natural reseeding of the reefs. So by mixing colonies with different genetic makeups together at each site, um, we can lead populate. We can lead to populations that are more robust and allow these corals to do what they do naturally, which is reproduce on the reef, um, and then they settle in a different area and and receive that area. Additionally, more live coral helps to slow the erosion of the reef framework, so that protects the wave breaking and fish production services that are associated with the reef. Um, and the science of restoration is also advancing quite quickly. Uh, and techniques are being developed to help um, us better understand how to help corals adapt to the effects of climate change and new emerging disease outbreaks. So people often ask what they can do to help. Um, there are things you can do both uh, if you live in or plan to visit the Keys or from afar. From afar, you can make sure your elected officials are voting in ways that help to protect the future of coral reefs and our marine environment as a whole. And specifically, there will be an opportunity soon to weigh in on the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary's restoration blueprint by providing public comment. And if you're in the Keys, um, check your sunscreens to make sure they don't contain chemicals that are known to harm corals. If you want to fish, snorkel, or dive, visit the sanctuary's website to find a list of Blue Star operators who are committed to helping to protect, protect sanctuary resources. If you plan to take a boat out on your own, um, take the sanctuary's boat or education course that covers topics that are specific to boating in the shallow waters and among the sensitive habitats of the Keys. And if you dive, you can volunteer to help um, uh, organizations uh, do coral restoration. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Kelsey and we can take questions. Yeah, thank you, Caitlin, um, for that great presentation. We are going to get started with our question and answer section. So Caitlin, yeah, there we go. You've stopped sharing. Um, so if you have any questions for our panelists, um, you know, go ahead, continue putting them in the Q&A box and the chat, uh, but I've got a few already in. Um, so my first question, we got a couple of questions from Jeff and Rick about plastics um, in the reefs that you guys are both studying. So maybe we can start with Peter. Um, are you seeing microplastics or plastic pollution in Gray's Reef? So I'm not, so microplastics are a different, different beast that uh, uh, my, my eyesight is waning. Uh, so I can't, uh, I'm sure they're there. Uh, uh, how they compare to other uh, other areas uh, along the the, the, the the long shallow shelf is is unclear. We certainly see a, a occasional plastic and and uh, other kinds of uh, human you know uh, discarded material on the reefs. It's 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 not absent, but it's not as terrible as I've seen other places. Uh, so yeah, I mean there's 
I do a, a lot of work in the deep ocean as well, and you, it and it's it's shocking. But even in the you know on a seamount in the middle of the North Atlantic, you know miles and miles and miles from the uh, from our exclusive economic zone, every once in a while you'll see plastic netting or or soda cans or at least those will uh, corrode. Uh, but you know there are things human the the, the human footprint is sadly everywhere. Um, Caitlin, we got another question about whether there has been research on the effects of microplastics on coral. Do you know anything about that? So I don't know a lot about that, but I do know that they have found um, corals eating microplastics. So, you know, there's that. I think there's probably no place on earth at this point that you can't find microplastics. Awesome. Um, well, we also had a question about the coral disease you mentioned, Caitlin. Um, what specifically is that coral disease and sort of what's the scale of the problem? So the scale is huge and we don't know yet um, what is causing it. There's a lot of research going into sort of how it's spreading um, and what, if there even is a pathogen, what it is. Um, so it's been difficult to treat because there's not a really good baseline of what's causing the problem, um, but it is very widespread. It has moved throughout, it, so it started in the Miami area um, and it moved, it, it just recently, about a year ago, was observed in Dry Tortugas National Park. So it has affected the entire Florida Reef Tract. Um, and it is seen, I don't know what the current number is, but um, in many places throughout the Caribbean as well. How, how far north does it, does it move? Um, or has up, it? up where coral exists. I mean, it's, it's affected the entire reef track. So, um, so off up the Palm beach and yeah. yeah. Um, well, we have another question, um, for Caitlin, um, can you explain what coral bleaching is and what effect it's having on the Florida Keys? Sure. So corals, so a coral is an animal, but it has an algae that lives inside it called zooxanthellae. Um, and it lives in its tissue and it's a symbiotic relationship. The algae provides um, energy to the coral and the coral provides a place for it to live. And so corals also eat, like I said, they're eating microplastics. Um, but they get a significant portion of their energy from the algae that lives within their tissue. And so when a coral bleaches, it becomes stressed and it expels those that algae. So it looks white because you don't see that green or brown algae that was living within its tissue. Um, and they can, corals can um, survive bleaching. They can, when the water temperature cools down and they're less stressed, they can bring that algae back into their tissues. Um, but if they are left, if they don't have that algae for too long, then they can die because it's providing them with so much of their energy. Um, so we have had a couple, in my time at least, a couple significant bleaching events in the Keys in 2014 and 2015. Um, and since then, we see, um, you know, we might see certain areas with uh, I don't know that we've had severe bleaching anywhere since then, but we have had some moderate bleaching. Um, and we have a pretty um, wide scale uh, monitoring that happens every summer for bleaching called disturbance response monitoring. Um, and so we do have a pretty good understanding of how, um, how often the corals are bleaching in the Keys. And luckily we haven't seen it in the last couple of years, but you know, we're seeing this stony coral tissue loss disease that's having in some ways um, at least a more acute um, impact on the reefs. Yeah. Thanks for that, Caitlin. Um, we also have a question here. I think it's for Peter um, referencing what what was on the um, sea turtles back that was that you showed in your presentation? Oh, I, uh, I think they were barnacles, very large barnacles that uh, off, often hitch, um, different species hitch, you know, essentially settle on 
the carapace of the of the turtle and grow and live out their life history. Uh, probably to the, to the the sea turtle doesn't even sense that they that these things are there. Yeah, just one more of those species interactions that you can see at Gray's Reef. Yeah. Um, Caitlin, I've got a question here about how coral restoration is funded. Well, it's funded. <laughs> Um, it's funded in many different ways. Um, I would say probably mostly federal and state grants. Awesome. Um, well, Peter, I had a question for you, which was um, thinking about the value of the research reserve and how it's telling us more about the threats facing Gray's Reef. So, uh, <clears throat> as, I, as, I, as I noted uh, in the talk, the, the, the research area, the closed area, uh, serves as, such, as a barometer uh, or, a, a, or you know, our ability to understand change by comparing areas outside uh, that are used by humans for fishing and other kinds of recreation uh, to what goes on inside. And to date, and a couple of years ago, we published a five-year report uh, from 2011 to 2016 uh, uh, of results, and there, there's there's still work ongoing. Although things were interrupted uh, by COVID, uh, still interrupted by COVID, uh, to, uh, to 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 develop these longer time series of changes in fish community structure and vertebrate community structure. Uh, species interactions of predators, the kind of work I'm um, doing. In fact, I'm going down in a, uh, next month uh, to collect some data. But uh, but so I mean, so we haven't seen. I mean, there are there are some things vary inside and out, or there's more variability outside than inside, which might be a signal of uh, human use uh, fishing effects. Uh, but overall, uh, the, the community composition. Is pretty similar. Uh, a study I, uh, that I was part of uh, with a colleague sh showed that there was greater uh, uh, density of forage species of forage fish based on acoustics, uh, using acoustics to you know ping the water column uh, outside than inside, which was an interesting result. But it could be a, 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 a we hypothesize that it's due to an in increased density or increased threat of predation inside the closed area because there are more predators there. And so uh, forage fish might can move outside uh, to reduce their predation risk. So there are some, some uh, minor changes. The invertebrate community was similar outside uh, as inside. But again, I think that, that's good news. It shows that the, that the human uses in the uh, outside the closed area are sustainable today. And but being able to but you know things can change over time. So you have being able to have this area as a reference, uh, as well as a place to study, you know, in the vernacular how the ocean works in, in the absence of humans, uh, is a really valuable thing that uh, hopefully will continue into the future. The management plan uh, revision of the management plan is going to be coming up next year, uh, and and so you know it'd be good to keep an eye. Uh, for that, I mean, it just to, uh, uh, to 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 be clear, I'm the chair of the Gray's Reef Sanctuary Advisory Council, uh, but I'm not speaking as the chair, and I'm not even speaking as a member of the SAC. Uh, but just to just to, as a as a heads up to the audience that uh, the management plan revision is going to be uh, is going to be co uh, coming out of the gate sometime next year, as I understand the plan to be. Yeah, well, speaking of human impacts and how we, are, we can see them um, in our national marine sanctuaries, Caitlin, what, aside from climate change, has been one of the largest impacts on the Florida Keys and, and what can we do to stop it? Yeah, I would say um, I talked a little bit about it, but water quality. Um, so within the Keys, uh, we have just recently switched I think something like 95% of um, most of the homes here were used septic, septic tanks and cesspools. Um, but our, what the, the reef that we're built on is very porous. And so that was not really 
those can work in certain places, but they don't work well here. Um, and so we've switched over to central sewage. Um, so that has eliminated sort of the, the more local um, cause of some of the water quality issues, um, like nutrients getting in from wastewater. <laughs> and, um, but there's still big water quality issues in Florida. So um, coming out of the Florida Bay from the Everglades and then also from up north. Um, and as I mentioned, this area is very connected. And so all of that water is getting moved around. Um, the water in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary is not just the water that comes off of the Florida Keys um, archipelago. So. Um, well, we have a, a fun question here from um, one of our attendees on um, for Peter. So the attendee asked, in Gray's Reef, um, is the underwater scenery as clear and colorful as your images on your slideshow indicated? Um, and then did you alter any of your images for, for that slideshow? Uh, so... Uh... The days that the visibility was terrible and I couldn't take pictures, I didn't use those pictures. Uh, and uh, I've done little other than maybe adjusting brightness and contrast. Uh, I don't do do any. I'm red green colorblind, so I have I, I screw I screw up any kind of color adjustments to things anyway. Uh, but. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, no, that that is what it looks like. I mean, some of some of them, some of the pictures were just using available light, uh, and visibility was indeed that good. I use wide angle lenses that help uh, uh, enhance color saturation, but I don't usually don't even use. I don't often use lights if I'm taking pictures collecting data because it affects the fish. And then sometimes I just take pictures to document things, and I might use movie lights, so I'm bringing some illumination. Uh, to the bottom, but other than that, we don't do anything to the to, to the images. So you know what you see is what you get. It is. It's a very cool place, and hardly anybody goes there. And I really don't even like saying that because I don't want more people going there. Uh, but uh, uh, it, it it's uh, if it, it's a it's a it's a unique place to see. Yeah, definitely one of those hidden gems. Um, Caitlin, another question for you. What would you say that, would you say that ocean acidification or ocean temperature change or sewage pollution contributes the most to coral bleaching and coral die off within the sanctuary? Are you able to distinguish between those? <laughs> Big question. Uh, I, yeah. I wouldn't even hazard a guess. I think that most likely that's a synergistic, um, you know, corals, they say they're dying from death by a thousand cuts. And I don't know that it, you can't easily tease out um, other than in sort of lab experiments, what is affecting a coral at any given time. Um, and I think likely there is an interaction between those things that will harm them even more than one or the other at a time. Yeah. Well, yeah. even so just having to raise, you know, raise a point about Gray's Reef in the, in the Southeast, uh, you know, cl climate change is global and, and, and it's effect and it, and it changes, uh, small changes in temperature can change uh, the competitive advantage of different species. Uh, too. So one animal that that today is a dominant predator or a dominant competitor for another on the reef uh, may switch. Uh, we see that in Connecticut and Long Island Sound, uh, the difference between slipper shell limpets and blue mussels. Uh, and uh, but in, in grays, you know, we see uh, like almost everywhere else in the Caribbean, uh, lionfish and but they're seasonal invaders. And their numbers are relatively low, and 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 there's some removal activities that that happen. But as there's been some recent publications, where as temperatures increase off the southeast, uh, lionfish will become year-round residents, and so their ecological impact will will uh, certainly increase as their presence is, has uh, more greater longevity uh, to it. And that's just kind of you know one example of that kind of that kind of effect elsewhere. Yeah. 
Yeah, and for, for those audience members who don't know, can you say a little bit more about what lionfish are and what threats they Sure, so lion, lionfish are, I mean, they're beautiful uh, animals. There's uh, uh, two species uh, that were introduced uh, likely by accident uh, during a storm off the coast of Florida from uh, aquarium importers. Uh, and there may have been some enhancement by people letting their fish go, but that <coughs> remains to be seen. Uh, but they've, there was enough animals to be able to reproduce. And uh, through uh, uh, transport uh, by currents of their larva, uh, they've invaded the Bahamas. They've had, well, they, I mean, without tracing every, out every little bit, they've, they're, they've invaded the entire Caribbean basin, uh, including the Florida Keys. They're ambush predators. And well, and up, we've had them in Long Island Sound in the summer uh, off the Connecticut coast. And they are ambush predators. Uh, they've got long frilly spines. Uh, they have uh, uh, venom in their in their dorsal spines that they can use for defense. Uh, they're they're striped for at least camouflage in terms to other other fishes, and they sneak up on small fish, uh, uh, juvenile sizes of species that grow larger, as well as and there are many species on coral reefs mm -hmm. uh, like small wrasses and. And, and, and blennies uh, that have important ecological functions. Well, everybody's got an important ecological function in, in some way, but these become food uh, for lionfish. So they can have significant effects on, uh, on community structure. Yeah, so invasive species threats, threatens that the coral in the Caribbean and apparently, yeah, as it, climate change happens could even be a bigger problem up North too. Um, we have a question from Deborah for Caitlin. Um, how many people are replanting corals and how do you attach new corals to the reef? So there are a number of different organizations in Florida that, were, that are working on and, and throughout the world. Um, but uh, it was sort of born in Florida out of a dire need <laughs> for, for a solution. Um, so I, I can't say an exact number, but um, I would say there's probably at least 15 to 20 organizations um, that are, you know, and some of those are, that's all they do is just focus on, on coral restoration. Um, and so the, there's many different methods. Um, I guess the most sort of used now is the sort of common coral gardening method, which is that corals are brought into a nursery um, it can be on land or in the water, but the, the more basic one is in the water. Um, and then they can be fragmented. So like you would do with a tree or a plant, you can just cut a portion off the coral and it'll keep growing. Um, and then those, so what we do is like, we track clones of the original coral in the nursery. Um, and then they can be reattached to the reef using cement, epoxy, um, nails and zip ties, there's a bunch of different methods that people use, but um, yeah. Yeah, that is very interesting. I wonder if there are videos of people nailing coral to the, to the reef structure. I don't think I have any, but I'm sure there are out there. If you just Google <laughs> coral restoration, there's tons of pictures and um, the sanctuary has their own plan, Mission Iconic Reefs, um, that gives some background of the methods, so. Yeah, we can definitely send a link out to everyone um, to the, those resources. Um, and then finally, we have a question from Donna. Um, as sea level rises, will increasing depth hurt the reefs? So you can go, I'll ask Caitlin that first and then maybe go to Peter. Um, That's a tough question. <laughs> um, I think it could. I think that with if if we had not developed the shoreline the way that it was, corals would potentially, or reefs in general, would potentially move um, with, as our shorelines change. Um, corals are they're very slow growing, so they are a little bit harder to adapt to to things because of that. Um, so I would say it's hard to say. Um, I don't know. 
I mean, there's, again, there's going to be other things happening, like the water is going to be warmer. And so it's not just the, the change in depth that's going to be changing. There's going to be lots of other things changing too. And so it's hard to predict um, sort of how all of that will play out together. Yeah. And Peter, will the level of the ocean change things at Gray's Reef? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry. The, I mean, it, same kind of, of, of uh, answer uh, that Caitlin had. Is that, I mean, there's a, a number of related uh, uh, issues that are going to occur as sea level rises. And you know, you know, one of them certainly is uh, increasing water temperatures. Uh, but that, but with that, it also changes uh, the depth of the thermocline. And depending on where that is, it's going to affect food delivery to the seafloor, uh, settlement of plankton and how internal waves uh, ride and deliver larva and food to organisms that live on the seafloor. So there's a number of cascading uh, effects that uh, of climate change, sea level rise being one of them, but then there are the effects on a number of oceanographic processes and depending on where organisms sit uh, and their life histories, will there'll be some winners and there'll be some losers. You know, with the rising temperatures, you know, losers are, are you know, certainly at least as we understand it today for principal, you know, corals. Uh, but there, I mean, there are there are uh, a, not, a, multiple other other effects that we're only discovering uh, now through uh, through research, both in the field and in the lab. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Looking into the future is hard as we consider all of the different changes that that warming waters are going right. to give make for our oceans. I mean, we're all kind of, you know we're all on this one big experiment. Uh, and, you know, the challenge maybe necess isn't necessarily even the science, it's taking those results and turning those into, into alternatives that we need to consider in order to, 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 to minimize and reverse those effects. It's the social, it's the societal governance challenge that's probably the most daunting. Yeah, well, um, given that we are at time, that sets me up perfectly. Um, as Caitlin mentioned in her presentation, we actually are expecting to have an opportunity to weigh in on the future of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary in the next coming months. Um, so I am gonna be popping an action in the chat. If you want to be part of the effort to help us save the Florida Keys, you can add your name here to send an email to NOAA Administrator Rick Spinrad, um, encouraging him to take three concrete actions to better protect the keys in the upcoming management process. Um, we'll also keep you all informed about changes to the Florida Keys management, um, other ways that you can help um, you know, participate in coral reef restoration, um, as well as working on Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary in the coming months. So thanks everyone so much for coming. Um, thanks to Peter and Caitlin for joining us to tell us more about the reefs off of our coast. Um, and definitely, if you enjoyed this webinar, join us next week for our Underwater Forests webinar that'll be hosted by our Washington State Director, Pam Clough. Um, we'll learn about the kelp forests that are home to an equally array, amazing assortment of ocean life, learn about the other rainforests under our oceans. Um, thank you all for participating and coming, um, and hopefully you learned more about you know, the places off our coast and how we can protect them.